Hello, I'm Michael Cantrell, and you are listening to the Prison Officer Podcast, a place to have a conversation about the forgotten cops that work in this country's jails, prisons, and correctional centers. A place for me to try to make sense of a career spent working inside the fence with some of the greatest people that nobody sees or recognizes for the important job they do to keep this world safe. If you love this podcast, hit the follow button, or better yet, share with your family, friends, or coworkers. Hello, and welcome back to the Prison Officer Podcast. This is Mike Cantrell. I'm glad you're joining us again today, and I have a special guest, um, a friend of mine and a former coworker. Uh, we recently both retired and kind of reconnected on LinkedIn, which if you guys aren't on LinkedIn, I, I keep up with a lot of people that I've known over the years through LinkedIn and, and get to reconnect with people like Brian O'Connell here. Uh, Brian, uh, he's been around corrections a long time. Uh, we'll ask him exactly how long, but he's been in a uh, retired as a superintendent or warden. Uh, I think the Missouri Department of Corrections still calls them superintendents. It, but, we're uh, wardens now, yeah. Are you wardens? Okay. Yeah, so yeah. He's a retired uh, we used to be superintendents. Yes, yes. <laughs> so he's a retired warden and um, has a lot of family connections to corrections. So I want to dig into that and hear about his career and his his family connections. And welcome to the Prison Officer Podcast, Brian. Hey, thank you, Mike. I appreciate uh, getting to be on with you. I've enjoyed listening to your podcast over the last year and enjoyed reconnecting with you. So glad to be here. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, so I always like to go back a little bit, um, and I tell people I want to hear, you know, how you got started and um, where you grew up at, and if there was any, um, and with you, I know there is, so there's probably, a, it's going to be a little bit different story for mm-hmm. you, mm-hmm. but I usually don't run across people that know about corrections until they've gotten older, but for you, right. it was something that you knew from being a young person. So where did you start off yes. at and grow up at? And give us a uh, I grew up in Springfield. Uh, I grew up in Springfield, Missouri, um, uh, kind of on the kind of west, uh, southwest side of town. Um, I uh, pretty early on uh, had an interest in in corrections. I, uh, as I've told you before, my uh, both my grandfathers are retired from the Federal Bureau of Prisons, and uh, mm-hmm. so it was always a, a, a thing that I was aware of. Um, not something that was talked about a ton, but it was something that, you know, as a kid, you know, my, both my grandfathers had, um, various, uh, items of, of memorabilia from their careers, uh, kind of around their houses. And, um, fortunately sure. I, you know, after the, they've both passed away, um, quite some time ago, but I actually have a lot of those items, um, here in my house. And, uh, and so it's something that I always, you know, was aware of. Um, kind of a funny story that I that I tell is that um, both my grandfathers worked at the Federal Medical Center, um, worked other places as well, but they started at the. They both worked at the Federal Medical Center. Both I believe started there, and um, at one point, um, both of them lived in the um, uh, the staff housing, what they referred to as the reservation. Um, at mm-hmm. the Federal Medical Center in Springfield. Um, right. And my parents actually met when they both lived there. So I always say that, you know, my, my parents actually met in prison, and that's a fact that they did. Um, so, uh, you know, when you drive by there, you know, my mom or dad can say, well, I used to live over there. I actually think both of them, their houses have been torn down since that time. But because uh, that was right. back in the, would have been the, uh, 50s probably end up maybe in the early 60s i don't know exactly when that when uh when they were both living there but both lived there and uh um they say my parents actually met in the what would have been i guess the early early 60s and uh um my grandfather's um my grandfather joseph o'connell joe he was uh, uh he retired from the uh, from, from the Federal Medical Center. Um, I also uh, had a stint uh, in Leavenworth. Um, he actually uh, uh-huh. um, made lieutenant in Leavenworth. So um, my father uh, lived, I believe, a couple of years in in Leavenworth as a as a as a kid growing up, and uh, he retired in the in the late '60s um, from the medical center. And then my other 
as a lieutenant. And my other grandfather, um, George Pickett, he was, uh, he also started at the medical center, worked numerous places, worked at, uh, right. worked in uh, two or three stints in, in Springfield, but also worked at, in Ashland, Kentucky, El Reno, Oklahoma, uh, worked at the federal prison, which was one of actually the three original federal prisons, uh, the federal prison, which later became a state prison and has been decommissioned since, but in, on McNeil Island in Washington. And yes. so he worked yeah. there as well and then transferred to um, the uh, U.S. Penitentiary in Marion, Illinois, and he retired from there in early 1974 um, as the warden. He was uh, uh, both an associate warden and a warden at, uh, at Marion. I believe was, a, was an associate warden at uh, McNeil, was actually the, wow. uh, the captain, the, the chief of security at, in Springfield at, at one point. Um, so both my grandfathers, they worked together, knew each other, you know, obviously. Uh, um, <laughs> and so, uh, so that's kind of, you know, my, my background is, it, it, like I say, is, as you said, is different than most. And that I have always, you know, just been been aware of corrections. Um, my grandfather uh, George, uh, he was very. Um, that was something he was always very proud of. His prison, he always referred to it as the prison service, is how he would refer to it. And uh, yep. Um, and uh, he retired. Said in 1974 and. Um, passed away actually when he was retired 30 years retired I mean passed away in 2004 so had a a, a good long retirement um, and uh, that was something he was always you know he 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 was very proud of he was very uh, I know he was involved in the federal prison retirees association and and would go to mm -hmm. events uh, uh, with that organization during his time had a, a lot of friends you know pretty much all of his uh, Friends uh, that li lived around in the area, were, you know, had several of them had retired here in this in the Springfield area, and so he kept in touch with them. I was real close with them, and so, you know, had friends as as I know you have, you know, had friends um, all over the country, and uh, yeah. you know, people that yeah. uh, that you you know visit. I remember as a as a kid, you know, traveling with my grandparents, and we stayed in um, a little town in Kansas with with one of his. Uh, uh, former co-workers and uh, uh, I say he was real close with several um, uh, co-workers you know wardens and different folks that he had met throughout his career so that was something he really identified with my other grandfather didn't sure. talk about that a lot it was uh, um, and you know he died when I was much younger I was 14 when he passed away so I didn't get to right you know in a sense know him as well as far as you know hear about his you know, his experiences. So I, I know a lot of more of that through, through my father. Um, um, and, or I actually, it's funny, I got it out and I was kind of looking through it, but I actually have my, my grandfather, Joseph O'Connell's, uh, um, federal prison service employment history file that has documents oh, wow. going back to the 1940s. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it has certificates, it has applications that he filled out in the fifties and forties. And, uh, um, actually have a couple, have a commendation, have, uh, um, apparently he was, uh, uh, as you know, there was a, a, a disturbance at the medical center in 1959. 1959 and, uh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, I actually have a memo from 1959, um, uh, and a memo from, uh, to him and from him about, about that. And so, Anyway, there's, there's, like I said, there is a lot of history, so it was something I was always aware of and uh, interested in. I, when I, um, I remember I, either I was in high school or might have been early in college, you know, did a, uh, a report about prisons when I was a kid. Um, I like to say probably, I'd say 17, 18, 19 years old. And, uh, right. and then when I went to college, that was my primary interest. I actually ended up as a business, manage, a business management major. Um, uh -huh. at South Missouri State, now Missouri State University. And I had, uh, they didn't offer a, a major in criminal justice at the time. So I, I majored in business and I ended up minoring in uh, criminal justice. I actually was 
um, in the very first criminal justice class offered uh, at South Missouri State University and uh, cool. ended up, uh, having, having a minor in that. And so that was kind of my interest more than the business side of it. I, I was always interested uh-huh. in the corrections part just as a um, – that was just kind of where my, um, my interest uh, uh, led me. And I remember at a function probably as a senior in college – some kind of an, uh, an honors function and, you know, you're supposed to stand up and talk about, you know, what you want to do. And I remember very clearly, you know, standing up and saying, I, w- I wanted to be a prison warden and, and pretty much, cool. um, not, nobody who was ever, a pr- who is ever, or was ever a prison <laughs> warden says that, you know, most, most people say, you know, how they, they, they feel like they just kind of fell into it or, uh, you know, it wasn't what they started out wanting to do, but then that's how they ended up. But I was actually one of those rare people who said, yeah, that's what I, that's what I want to do. I want to work in prison. And uh, well, it's just always fascinated. Well, I wonder, um, yeah. I wonder a little bit, if you'd ask me when I was in high school if I wanted to be a prison warden, what little I knew about that came from, right. you know, uh, movies and you know, sure. cool hand Luke. And that's what I thought of when I thought of a prison warden, but you grew right. up with the knowledge of what they really did and that they weren't, you know, this guy out with a long cane stick whipping people in the field. Uh, right. Right. So I, I, that's interesting that, you know, you were able to take what you had learned from your family and, and go with that. So did your mm-hmm. mom or dad, did did it skip a generation with you? It did, did skip a generation. It did. Okay. It did. And I and I don't really know what that was about. Um, uh, but uh, neither of them. That was never their interest. Um, you know, they always had that sort of connection. You know, having lived there, and you know, their. You know, my my dad talks about his his father. You know, always going to, you know, going to work at. You know, they, they always called it the medical center. And I know nowadays a lot of folks refer to it as Fed Med or something like that, but. They always, my grandfathers, my parents always just referred to it as a medical center, and where, but we all knew what yeah. that meant, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, tell, you know, about his dad, you know, going to work early, so they play dominoes with the, uh, with his, you know, with his coworkers, you know, before his shift, and uh, um, so, yeah, it's just, I don't know, it's just, it's, it's, it's kind of ingrained in me, the, you know, you know, corrections, and uh, uh, I never, of course, my 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 grandfather um, on my dad's side, he was you know he he died when I was fourteen years old, so he was not aware uh-huh. really of my of my interest in the topic or or you know certainly didn't know of me working in the field. But uh, my grandfather George Pickett, he actually um, prior to his passing was able to uh, uh, come out. I was actually able to show him around my my facility, and you know every time we would see each nice. other, he would ask me about. Uh, you know, what was going on and, and, uh, you know, was very, very proud of the fact that I had gone into corrections too. He, he, he definitely saw that as a, as a, an honorable career, which I do as well. And, uh, so that's, that's kind of, uh, I always kind of had that. And it was, that was really a, I think I was, a I was either a unit manager or a deputy warden at the time when, when I brought him out of the facility. And, uh, but anyway, it was, sure. it was neat to have him come out and see my, uh, you know, uh, see where I worked and see what, you know, what I, what I was doing. And he was proud of, you know, my, you know, my progression, you know, at the time. And, you know, he would always, were either know, one of them knew that in I the would... military, were either one What's of them that? in the military? Uh, yes, one of both them were. In the military? Okay. They both were. Um, that was kind of a common theme. Yeah, it really was. I, my, my grandfather on my dad's side, um, I think he actually, um, he, of course, they're both of the World War II generation. Um, uh, grandfather on my dad's side, I think, actually was going through basic training or maybe had just completed basic training when the war ended. Um, and wow. uh, um, just looking through some of his stuff, he actually, prior to that, had worked as a civilian at the Kansas Ordnance Plant. And in the, in the early 40s, what would have been during the war, he would have, I believe this was his first working at the um, out at the the medical center was actually as a as a hospital attendant was the was the title that he wrote in there and that was in in like in the, in 1943 so while the war right. was going on 
Um, my other grandfather, he did uh, he he did serve in World War II. Was actually both both were World War II era veterans, but um, my other grandfather actually was uh, uh, was overseas, and uh, mm-hmm. I believe was actually uh, uh, overseas when my when my mother was born, and didn't see her until she was uh, um, several months. Uh, uh, or a year old. I don't remember exactly the timing, but, uh, right. so, but yeah, so both, both served. And I think, yeah, I, I think you're right. I think at that time it was very much a, a, a progression of, of, you know, from, uh, from the military into, um, corrections, uh, into the prison system. I think it felt, um, familiar. I think, you know, there was a, there was a familiarity sure. to the structure with corrections being, you know, kind of a paramilitary organization, you know, as far as the way things are set up and chain of command and such. And, uh, I think mm-hmm. there was quite a bit of, uh, of that as, as folks got out of the service after the war, then, then, then they would, uh, you know, both ended up in, in government jobs, you know, with, uh, you know, the rank Absolutely. structure and all that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, and all those vets coming back from world war two, uh, I think we still feel that in, uh, corrections. I think they, uh, you know, guided and built a culture uh, for mm-hmm. years, and that served us very well. I'm, I'm absolutely, you know, a lot of those guys were. They set the stage. They yes, yes. they set the way we do things, and yes. you're like command structure. But just that. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, how do I want to put it? The way that they did things well, even if nobody was looking. I mean, you go look through old mm-hmm. log books. And those guys spent uh-huh. time putting down on paper, like it was a military report, what had happened in their unit. And now you'll see stuff like uh, right. on right. shift, off shift, <laughs> you know. So that's fascinating that uh, those two, they saw some changes in the Federal Bureau of Prisons, too, because that time period mm-hmm. uh, was just full of changes, expanding no doubt corrections cause law enforcement and laws you know it corrections doesn't expand until community at large expands the laws and then more people get caught up under laws and more people end up in corrections so uh, we've seen that happen a couple of times the beginning of the bureau of prisons of course you take a look that was during prohibition Mm -hmm. you know a big change in the national laws and then uh, in the 50s and even up sure. into the 60s, you know, uh, crime changed in this country. Uh, so we had to build bigger prisons and federal became a bigger part of that. Mm-hmm. So that's interesting Definitely. what they got to see. You took me up to college with you. So let's go to your career. Um, so you get out of college. You've got a uh, degree, a minor in criminal justice. Uh, where are you where are you headed next? Mm-hmm. Well, I uh, it took me about a year and a half to uh, to 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 land in corrections. I knew that was what I wanted to do. Um, you know, these things, as as you know, take it. So it did take me a while. Uh, I actually um, I, I I interviewed for a job in El Reno, Oklahoma, which I didn't get. Um, it was actually a personnel type job. I also I actually um, right out of college. Uh, applied to be a, a, a correctional officer with the Federal Bureau of Prisons, and uh, I was very disappointed because what I got back was th- I got back something that said um, you're not eligible because you don't have six months of you know supervising people. Um, <laughs> well, as you know, you know how many 21 year old uh, uh, folks do have uh, uh, six months of supervising people, you know, and. Uh, right. And so um, that that didn't turn out to be the way that I went because that, that's I know that's one of the first things you know people say well why didn't you get into the you know the bureau like your like your grandfather's and it's like well you know I, um, it just it just didn't work out that way and um, uh-huh. and so I uh, applied for some other uh, you know law enforcement jobs and in the course of that you know I met an individual who was a parole officer with the Missouri Department of Corrections and. Uh, he encouraged me to apply, and uh, uh, I actually had interviewed for a parole officer job in uh, Jefferson City, and uh, didn't get that job. But interestingly enough, I I got a uh, I got a call, um, and they said, "Would you like to Would you like to come to Potosi, Missouri, to the Potosi Correctional Center?" 
uh, for a case mm-hmm. manager position, or would you be interested in interviewing for that position? And I remember the first thing I asked was, well, where is that? You know, I'm, I'm from Missouri, my whole <laughs> living in Missouri my whole life, but, um, you know, I'm from Southwest Missouri, like kind of like you are. And, uh, um, I, mm-hmm. I didn't know of Potosi, Missouri. I'd never heard of Potosi, Missouri. And, uh, so I actually, with my father, we um, we hopped in the in the car and we drove three three and a half hours where it was to uh, Potosi Correctional Center for for a job interview. Uh, I was uh, I was working the the summer, you know, to continue to kind of you know uh, in a in a warehouse at Springfield Tablet Manufacturing Company in Springfield, Missouri. So if you remember the old okay. Big Chief tablets when you were a kid, yep. you know that's where they came yep. from. And uh, anyway, I was working that job because I'd worked that all during college and stuff during the summer. And uh, I was actually working that job. And the next morning after my interview, they called and said, do you want to come work for us? And I said, well, sure. And uh, so I, uh, I loaded up everything I um, – pretty much everything I owned and uh, moved to uh, Potosi, Missouri, uh, which is about an hour south of St. Louis. It's, it's in yeah. sort of southeast Missouri. And uh, so that would a very have been, small town, 1992. So what was that, about 92? Yeah, 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 92. So, in July of 1992, I just, uh, I think I actually turned 24, two days before I started. So is Potosi, so I, it's almost uh, brand new, um, right? Yeah, yeah. Potosi opened in 1989, and so it was okay. brand new. It was uh, um, it was before the the really big building boom, if you will, in the Missouri Department of Corrections, as mm-hmm. far as, you know, all the several new facilities being built, which was in the, in the later nineties. And, uh, but it was a pretty much a brand new facility. Um, it housed the, um, the capital punishment, um, what most people think of as the death row for Missouri. Right. Um, right. and in addition to, um, uh, life without parole. Um, so, very serious offenders, a maximum security facility, obviously. And, uh, it was, um, when, uh, in 1989, when it opened, it actually, the death row from the old penitentiary, which I know you're familiar with, right. actually, um, uh, moved to, um, uh, Potosi Correctional Center. And, um, okay. Potosi was unique as far as that, you know, that population because, um, it was, uh, we in Missouri, which was a pretty revolutionary idea, and I think it's you know kind of ahead of um, most places now. But they uh, actually housed most of your capital punishment, or what folks would call death row offenders, in general population. So that was right. a that right. was kind of a unique situation. Whereas at the old penitentiary in Jefferson City, they had always been housed all together in a death row, you know, and I know you're familiar with the area where they were actually housed, um, from having worked there, but, um, Potosi was different in that it was, um, obviously a a newer, much more modern facility. And, uh, and actually they were, um, they were mainstreamed into the population. So, um, the thought being that they were, um, many times they were the, you know, they'd committed very similar crimes to the rest of the population. So, um, they were not, uh, they they were seen as you know very you know very similar in makeup to as far as the um, the population across the board um, as far as the type of crimes they committed you know often you know murders and and just very serious offenses and uh, so uh, but they were mainstreamed it was actually a very successful um, approach to handling that population um, right. but so yeah that's where I ended up I ended up at Potosi Correctional Center. Um, Thought it was a it was a fascinating experience. Um, uh, at that time, there were just two maximum security facilities in the state, and so that was Jefferson City. The you know which um, I think at that time it was still called it was called Jefferson City Correctional Center, but it, as you know it, it was actually officially renamed back to the old Missouri State Penitentiary name um, right. after that. And so when it closed, it was referred to as the Missouri State Penitentiary. Um, right. also known as the walls. And, uh, and so, you know, they were, we, we were one of the two maximum security facilities in the state at the time. Now there's, you know, several others, but, um, so, you know, we had a very similar population to the population of, um, uh, the penitentiary in Jeff city. And in fact, kind of 
you know, uh, our uh, offenders, you know, would go there and theirs would come to us. And so it was a, right. it, I say we were, we were very similar in the, in the, in the, uh, the makeup, the population, just a different type of facility. Well, um, you know, I say newer, much more modern. I don't know if you've ever been to Potosi, but it's, 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 nope. it, you know, it's, it's kind of looks like, you know, what, what, what you think of as a quote unquote modern, which is now over 30 years old, but, um, correctional center looks like, um, Mm-hmm. you know, gray and concrete so, and, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> lots of concrete, uh, yeah, lots of concrete. So you're, yes. Yes. You're, you're 24 years old. You're, yeah. um, even though you have had this, you know, growing up and got to hear about prison and stuff, what was it like first time the grill went bang behind you? It was, a, it was, it was really, it was, it was really something. I, I remember, one of the the memories that I think of is the my very first day. I uh, I worked primarily during my time there. I worked in the administrative segregation unit. So, you know, it was uh, you know basically the the guys that are getting in trouble in the general population end up in, in the segregation unit. So, you have a lot of uh, you know folks who are you know pretty bad actors. You know, and so um, I remember my very first day one of our duties as, as case managers was we would, you know, we would make, you know, regular rounds and we would go door to door and there's, you know, solids, you know, steel doors, you know, with the window and, and the, um, the chuck mm-hmm. hole and such. But there was a, you know, you would go door to door and you would just knock on the door, you know, and say, Hey, how you doing? You know, what's going on? Anything you need anything, you know, kind of thing. And I remember the very first time I walked into one of those units. So, uh, you know, there's a, you know, a, a pod or kind of a control bubble. And then there's kind of a sally port around that. And then you would go into the wing, so to speak. And then, you know, I say that that door would shut behind you and you're going to that wing and you can feel every eye in the place is on you. And you walk in there uh-huh. and it was just in. in the, so I was with another um, case manager and she was going to take me around and show me, you know, kind of what to do and such. And I remember that it was it was absolute bedlam in that unit and uh <laughs> I, I know you've you've been in units when it was like that where you walk in and it's they're screaming and yelling and and banging uh-huh. and you know just uh, you know i i i've never um had uh, someone say the things that people said to me that day i remember um and uh you know because i was uh you know i was uh brand new and uh and i'm sure looked brand new and uh i remember how you know that what that was like you know just it, it's hard to describe the the how loud and how uh raucous that was just a chaotic you know environment you know and uh sure. and as you know when you it, it, especially if someone new goes into a unit like that sometimes you know that it, it's not like that every time you go in there but there are times when, you know, guys are trying to, to show off. They're trying to get attention. They're trying to, uh, obviously want, you know, want you to do something for them or whatever. And so I remember going into that unit and just having that crazy, you know, atmosphere and it was like, Whoa, look at the, I mean, it was was quite an eye opener, you know? And, uh, and so it was, uh, it was certainly, you know, a, a, different environment than what I obviously what I was used to, you know, and, uh, then I remember, I don't know, within a, another week or two, I remember the very first time I went and did, did, did those rounds, uh, myself as a, a you know, uh-huh. just, just, you know, Hey, you know, we've shown you what to do, you know, go, go do this, you know? And I remember, you know, going into the, into one of these wings and it was very similar to that, but I would say, you know, the very first time I ever went to make rounds, there was a guy started a fire and so they uh one of the individuals kind of at the end of a i think it's on the bottom on the bottom tier was in a, a cell next to a shower um and there was a like a rubber mat sitting outside that shower door the individual right. caught caught that on fire so there's this black smoke emanating through the unit so there's a fire the very first time i go to make a um, uh, uh, rounds in the unit and, uh, and they had to, you know, ha- bring, bring folks in and, and evacuate that whole unit, you know, taking people out to the toughen individuals and taking them out to the, re- uh, the, you know, the rec yards and, 
and trying sure. to, you know, till they could get the, obviously get the fire out and get the smoke cleared and such. And I remember that just that, you know, sort of that chaotic kind of environment, you know, so it was, uh, it, it was definitely an eye opener. It really was. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and, uh, and, and during my time there in that unit, like I said, you know, made those regular rounds. I would do uh, one of the things we would do a couple times a week. We would have committees that would decide if individuals could be released from the segregation unit. We call it the ad seg uh-huh. committee. And you would determine whether or not they could be released from the unit or if they uh, needed to stay. And if so, you know, how long and, uh, you know, when we would review them next and that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, individuals, you know. Uh, obviously there was individuals that were that were in that environment when I when I got there and when I when I left and transferred 15 months later they were still in that environment you know still right. acting the same way and obviously there was folks that did move in and out of that unit and uh, but uh, at, at that time as I think I think you know um, it was um, segregation or that type of I- environment was um, it, it was a common way to deal with most problems. And honestly, probably sure. was, I don't say probably, but was, you know, it was, it was something that was over, overused. And, uh, you know, of course in, in, in more recent times, you know, there's definitely been a move to, you know, limit the use of segregation, limit how long individuals stay in segregation, give folks a way out of segregation. Um, Absolutely. you know, cause it, as you know, it, it definitely, you know, can, can affect the mental health of, of, of individuals, you know, if, uh, you know, prolonged stays in segregation can be detrimental to, to, uh, sure. the mental health of those who are housed there. And so that was something, you know, that they say at that time it was, that was a, you know, a pretty common res- you know, yep. response to things and, uh, and the individuals, Absolutely. not only were they put in segregation, but they would stay there for, you know, quite long periods of time. Um, right. When I was there, it was a a single bed facility, so it was considered a, it was really a fairly small. I think at the time it was probably five or six hundred um, uh, offenders in the population in the, in the whole facility. Until right before I left, they were all single cell units, a single cell. Mm-hmm. Um, so the whole place, you know, it, it was it it was basically kind of a super max environment. You know, before that was kind of the a common term. Um, right. Not all those individuals, of course, were were in a segregation environment. So that many of many of them were in general population. But you know, there were yeah. quite a lot of folks in segregation. So you know, dealt with you know um, all manner of folks. They say you know that was that was just that that was the environment. You had individuals that were um, you know sentenced to death, and you also had individuals you know I say life without parole, you know life in fifty sentences. So guys that you know. Yeah. It, you know, and or individuals that that really messed up at another facility. So, you know, they yeah. assault somebody at a lower level facility. They, you know, do, you know, get involved in some uh, some real serious thing that we were kind of the, the last stop, if you will, for those folks. So sure. it was definitely yeah. a, a, quite an education for me for that during that time. Yeah, yeah I do remember uh, the use of segregation. I mean, um, back when I started, if an officer wanted to, you could basically put an inmate in the hole over the weekend and mm-hmm. do that. Just hold them over the weekend and, and then let them out on Monday and they'd have to get all their property back. And that was kind sure. of a punishment way. Sure. But, uh, now we're leaning, there's gotta be some place in the middle because there is. There, there uh, is. you've yeah. probably um, worked, you've, you've probably worked with them also, but there's inmates that don't need to be out around other staff and other inmates. Um, now that doesn't mean that we lock them in one cell and leave them there, but right. we can't let them all loose either. Right. Uh, but what was going on back then, like you talked about really, yeah, you'd have guys go into a seg and they'd disappear and there wasn't a way out. And I think that was a mm-hmm. really good way of putting that was, uh, mm-hmm. giving them a way out. And that was something that we missed back then. Mm-hmm. So yeah. were you involved with any of the, uh, any of the executions? Did they do any of those while you were there? There were five executions during the 15 months I was there. That was not something I ever was directly involved in. And, uh, okay. Of course, there was a very, um, rigid protocol about the procedure, about how to, how to make the, you know, the, the execution happen and, uh, you know, how right. that would. And I remember if there was going to be an execution, it would be, 
the the access to the facility would be very very limited so if it yes. was the end of your day and your shift you know they didn't want you staying later if you weren't part of that admin you know that team that was that was part of that um execution or you know what fill one of the various roles in that in that uh team then you know you need mm-hmm. to get out you know it was like this is you know this is what's going on here tonight and so we have a very uh, rigid structure about who does what and who's in these various roles and obviously access to facility is that much more restrictive than it would be under a normal environment and uh, sure. so it was uh, I, I, I encountered those and I remember going to you know I've been in the um, into the observation cell with individuals that were on observation you know prior to the execution they would be placed in the in that um, observation cell with a, a staff sure. member watching them, you know, 24 hours a day for usually just a matter of days, a few days. But I, you know, I've been into that observation mm-hmm. room and, you know, had to conduct hearings with individuals that um, scheduled to be executed. So, so sure. yeah, I've dealt with that. And, and, a, and a, a large number of the folks that I dealt with on a day-to-day basis were individuals who were, you know, the, those, those capital punishment in, inmates or, Oh, um, yeah. life without parole and, and, you know, absolutely people that I remember seeing or hearing their stories, you know, as a, as a kid growing up, you know, sometimes you would have the person who was, you remember from the news, you know, as a kid, you know, um, that you're dealing with, not necessarily for the executions, but just for other things, you know, come, you know, yeah, it was yeah. definitely quite a, quite an environment, you know, was involved in, you know, writing the, um, we were one of the we were a facility that actually took individuals that were um, sentenced to uh, uh, capital punishment. They actually delivered them directly to us at that time. Right. You know, from when they were sentenced, I mean, they were they were brought to us. Whereas most offenders, yep. you know, go through a diagnostic process. We actually did the diagnostic process on, um, ourselves at the facility, and so they would be brought to us from the from the court when they were sentenced and. Uh, was involved in, you know, helping to write a couple of the uh, diagnostic you know, reports, summaries, you know, right. that, that were done, you know, uh, uh, for new new arrivals, if you will. And uh, so, um, but that was kind of my 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 connection to that is that was that was obviously something that was a, a significant part of what what happened at Tulsa Correctional Center. They were at sure, that time sure. they were executed there at at the facility. Later, in yeah. later years, that well, that process, the execution was actually transferred to a um, to the facility in Bon Terre. Um, but the population still, until the, until right before the execution, they actually still stayed and and still do to this day at, at Potosi Correctional Center. Right. So I think another thing that we kind of have in common, because I started off at Missouri State Penn, you started right. off at Potosi, and then we both transferred to Ozark Correctional Center, which yeah. is like the yeah. opposite of both of those. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. It, yeah, as far as far from that as you could get, yeah. So half those inmates when I was there were going out on work release every day. Mm-hmm. So yes. how did you get to OCC and uh, tell me about your time there? I um, was very happy with my time at Potosi. I, um, I say I was there right at 15 months and I always said, you know, if it had been closer to home, I'd, I'd probably, I might have uh, I might have uh, been there the whole time uh, of my career. Sure. But I actually... Uh, had the the personnel contact me because they knew that I was, you know, I was, uh, I was alone at that time. I was, you know, I was single. I was um, living up there during the week and actually would drive home uh, de- over on the weekends and uh, then make that yep, drive back, here. you know? And so, you know, did that a lot of times um, over that 15 months and, you know, the personnel said, Hey, there's a, there's a case manager position at the, uh, down at, uh, at, at Ozark Correctional Center in Fordland, um, which is about 30 minutes from, you know, from where I grew up. And a, a couple of the folks, uh, one of the unit managers at Potosi and one of the, um, what they call it then, the associate superintendents, uh, um, would be deputy wardens, you know, to us now, um, had both actually come from OCC. And they both uh, spoke up on my behalf um, to the folks that were at, at Ozark Correctional Center at the time. And so... Uh, um, I interviewed at OCC and um, came to OCC in October of 1993, uh, actually as a case manager, just a lateral move, and actually right. was there until early last year when I retired after 28 okay. and a half years with the department. So 
Um, I, I, I know it's different. It's kind of a different trajectory than some, you know, I didn't, I didn't move around a lot. I, um, I, I found some place that, um, was home or felt like home to me and that's where I stayed right. and then progressed in my career um, from case manager to unit manager to deputy warden or associate superintendent at the time. And then, um, and then to eventually to warden uh, of the facility. So tell us a little bit about OCC for those that don't know. Uh, sure. Well, you know, we uh, kind of, as you, as you mentioned, that's kind of where our paths crossed. Um, we would have worked together probably, Three years or so, probably ninety six to maybe ninety nine, something like that, um, give or take. Yeah. But um, yeah. I came to when I came to Ozark Correctional Center, um, we were in the in the process of of gearing up to become a a dedicated treatment facility. You know, so obviously we did other things during that time, but we were we were moving toward um, a therapeutic community drug treatment program, and so. Mm -hmm. Um, Ozark Correctional Center um, at that time was 650 beds, um, which is obviously, as you know, that's a that's a small small facility, a small camp. Right. And um, and and as you also said, it's you know it's the the farthest thing from the environment that I came from and the one that you came from as far as the um, you know just just what that was all like. And so Ozark Correctional Center was a minimum security facility. And very involved in work release. We had a lot of individuals in work on work release. Um, we were, like I say, getting ready to gear up to uh, start this treatment program, which is, you know, we're going to be a pretty big step um, for the facility and for, for for the department, really. Who we were going to be, mm -hmm. and uh, and and uh, the you know the largest treatment facility in the state. So uh, in early 1994, um, I believe it was February of 1994. We started um, the treatment program uh, with 16 um, offenders, and there had been a law passed because uh, it was the 217362, which was a, a long-term drug treatment uh, law that right. allowed for individuals to to be sentenced by the judge to you know x number of years, and then would have an opportunity to. Um, but under this law would have be stipulated for this uh, uh, program and they would have an opportunity to come to us and could complete a drug treatment program, um, which the, the allowed for up to allowed for up to two years and could be released um, by the, uh, the judge. And they wouldn't have mm -hmm. to do that, that longer um, sentence that, that they were, that they were facing. They always referred to that sentence as their backup time. So the population was going to be made up of those folks. It was also going to be made up of individuals that came to us from other prisons within the state system that the parole board had reviewed them. They were coming up to the end of their sentence, and they felt like, uh, based on their history, that they needed to have drug treatment services. Um, as right. you know, a very high percentage of individuals in our, in our prisons um, uh, have pretty significant substance abuse histories. Yep. Yep. You know, very high percentage. Um, a lot more honestly than than can or do get get the treatment they need, you know, especially in the, this type of environment. So right. we were going to provide a long term treatment solution effectively uh, effectively for the department. You know, it's going to be longer than any of the other programs. There were some, you know, 90, 120 um type short term programs out there for drug treatment, but we were really kind of uh gonna be you know, embark on something a little more, um, you know, more intense than that. As you know, uh, especially a person who's been involved in, in substance abuse and, you know, in crime for a lengthy period of time, it takes time. If you're going to make a change in them, um, it takes mm -hmm. time to make that, to bring that about. And I think that's yeah. what long-term treatment would provide. Um, and so uh, we started transitioning to a, a treatment program, um, and over about a year, we turned the whole population over. So by the time you would have come to OCC, we were entirely a treatment facility. So everybody at our facility was 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 in treatment. Um, um, I, I'm a big, big believer in treatment. I think it's I think it's a um, it, it is so critical um, to help an individual. Yeah. Um, 
you know, to to make the changes they need to make. You know, there's a pretty significant, um, you know, we used a model because it's called the therapeutic community. And therapeutic community is really just a way of um, making the community um, responsible for um, for other members of the community. You know, we always say, mm-hmm. you know, here we expect you to be your brother's keeper. You know, we, we expect you to do different than what the old, you know, what was oftentimes, you know, referred to as the convict code, you know, as far as how an individual does time in, in corrections. And so the old convict code sure. would say, hey, you don't, you don't get anybody else's business. You do your own time. Somebody else is doing something they shouldn't be doing. Hey, that, that didn't affect you. Don't, you know, don't worry about it. Don't, uh, don't say anything about it. Don't, don't tell on them. Well, all that kind of thing. And therapeutic sure. community kind of turns that on its head and basically says, we want you to be responsible for one another. We want you to actually call each other on behavior and we're going to give you, um, tools to do that. It was very much, um, built on peer pressure, but using peer pressure for positive as opposed to negative as we're, you know, as we you know kind of get have been used to in corrections, you know, peer pressure, you sure. know, you'd say, oh, that's a bad thing. But in a therapeutic community, it's a critical part of doing this because you're really trying yeah. to get that guy to look at that person next to him and say, hey, I'm concerned about him. What he does does affect me. And I should care enough about him to to address his behavior. And so, you know, there was like the interventions that you could use and and they had, you know, tools that they called, you know, pull-ups where they would address each other on behaviors and stuff. And so, right. and it's it's definitely a process, and it's one of those things that is not a, you know, it doesn't happen quickly. Um, as I said, they didn't they didn't get this way uh, overnight, so you're not going to change the way they think overnight. So it's it's definitely just right. kind of that process. It was referred to the 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 community as the agent of change, which means, hey, it's going to be more about what happens when you're around other people, whether that's just living mm-hmm. with them. As you remember that, you know, Ozark Correctional Center, you know, we don't, other than the segregation unit, we don't have cells. We had bays and we had rooms. So eight men to sure. a bay, six, and then eventually eight men to a room. And and so, and then you'd be in a wing of, you know, 80 to 100 guys. So each one of those wings would be a community or a, you know, a family. And you would, so there would be structure within that wing and, and you would have yeah. individuals that were more responsible, not, not necessarily have authority over one another, but have more responsibility. So you can, you know, individuals could work into senior positions and they could kind of be, you know, they, they would work into essentially leadership positions as a, as mm-hmm. an offender in the community right. as they spent more time there and they, they were doing all the right things. And, uh, so it was definitely a different environment um, than you yeah. know, certainly what I had experienced before. I, I always liked the environment. I always felt it was, and always told people over the years and sort of, you know, saw thing, the, that the facility change over the years and do different things, but always still you know, committed to that drug treatment model. Um, but I always yeah. told people, say, I when you come to OCC, you're, you're going to find it's a more positive place than the, than the, any other place you go. And so I always was proud of that. I always felt like, you know, as you know, um, you know, working in, in prisons and being at a lot of prisons, you can kind of feel the, 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 the vibe of a facility when you go in it, you walk around, you know, how do people interact with one another? How does the staff interact with the offenders? How do the offenders interact with the staff? You know, what does that look like? And I always felt like Ozark Correctional Center was a more positive environment than the the average always said this is going to be the most positive place that you're going to get to when you when you're here at our facility yeah Yeah, and um you know i don't know what the numbers say but it it seemed to me that i saw more inmates that got something out of that and from my perspective it wasn't only some of the stuff you talked about but the drug treatment programs that i've seen as i've moved around tend to have a lot to do with sitting in a class and then pointing in a book and telling them what they should do and Ozark Correctional Center was always more skill based. You know, they had jobs. If they could work their self up to a point to where they could go out and have a real job and make real money, you know, sure. like you talked about on the wing. Uh, they didn't just mm-hmm. talk to them about leadership. These guys were expected to be in leadership positions, mm-hmm. kind of like you'd see in the military. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, you know, yeah. I remember, I, I don't know how long you guys did it, but uh, 
I remember bringing people from the outside to do skill-based classes, simple stuff like how to open a banking account, you know, how to get credit, mm-hmm. what credit was. You know, there's a lot of those guys yeah. that they never got those things through life. And right. so I always thought Ozark Correctional Center was a great model for that. And I saw a lot of good while I was there. And, and like you said, when, uh, you know, it was a, it was a positive place to work. Uh, you still had to be careful. It was a prison. You had to, you know, watch your, uh, sure. uh they weren't manipulating you, but at the same time, mm-hmm. um, most of them had goals at that point. And so mm-hmm. you could help them achieve those goals and, and actually watch them walk mm-hmm. out the gate and think, you know, that one might not come back, which right, I don't do right, a whole lot right. in my career. <laughs> right. Well, and we should do that more. And so, um, you know, I kind of feel like that should be the standard that we're after, you know, as we let people yeah. go, we, we should, we should feel, you know, pretty good and, uh, about, about their chances going out. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's just, a that's, I, to me, that's what it's about. I really, I'm, I'm, I'm a generally an optimistic person. And, uh, so even after 28, you know, years in, uh, in corrections, I, I'm, one of those people who actually think people can change. Um, certainly they yep. don't all change. Yep. And, so, and there are some right. people that, that don't want to change. But I think there's a lot of things you can do to create opportunities for them to, uh, yeah. to get better, kind of look at the world differently. I think that's what treatment does more than any other thing is, is try to get individuals to see themselves differently and see their, their fellow man differently you know, kind of see their role in, in society, um, and that they're not just sort of, you know, flying this, you know, flying solo, um, that there are, you know, people need to care about you and you need to care about other people. It's kind of what I always, I I always felt about, you know, about, um, you know, in order to, to be successful, you know, later in life. And, um, I always said, we said we had quite a bit of incentive for individuals as they move through, um, you know, treatment and, um, you know, you kind of had the old, you know, the carrot and the stick, you know, um, sure. and, uh, you know, when there was a, a more incentive to, to do right, you know, I, the, the truth is people <laughs> are more likely to do right, you know, and, uh, right. then there's the other side of it is the consequences. So that individual that, that, uh, fails in our program, you know, that, that sentence that was kind of, you know, over his head that he might have to do if he messed up, well, then he's going to have to go do that sentence or some percentage right. of it, whatever was appropriate based on, you know, their background and such. But, but you know, you, we'd have, to have individuals that anywhere from a sentence of, you know, four years to I, I've seen, you know, 20, 25, 30 year sentences, a time or two longer than that, that guys had an opportunity is like, you know, I can, I can go home in a year. Or go home and you know, up to two years. You know, said most of my career we were we were actually running right at a year. But there was a time when it right. was eighteen to twenty four months was was a little more the norm. Just think about what a difference that is for that individual with a twenty year sentence who yeah. can go to do this program, complete that program, and go home, as mm-hmm. opposed to serving you know however many whatever the number of years is that a, that he would have to do on that. 20 year sentence or that 25 year sentence. So that's a pretty big, yeah. uh, <laughs> that's, that's a pretty big carrot, you know? Um, yeah. and the consequence obviously is pretty, pretty strong. If you, if you don't do right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you got, uh, so you promoted up through their deputy warden to warden. So you were there for several years. What yeah. were, I mean, what were some of your big challenges that you faced, you know, leadership challenges or whatever? What were some of the challenges that you faced, you know, being a longtime warden there? A lot of challenges. We were, we were, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of responsibility associated with a position like that, as you know. And, uh, and so you realize how serious the, uh, the ramifications are of your actions, um, as you deal with staff and as, as you deal with offenders. And, um, and so that was something I always took very seriously because, you know, as I would make a decision about, for example, about whether an individual should be terminated from our program, you know, they had done something or a Uh series of somethings. And, uh, 
we would they would go before a program review committee that would say, you know, we think he should stay or we think he should go or if he stays, he stays under these conditions and such. And then so that would come to me. And that was something a, a responsibility I always took very seriously, especially as I looked at individuals right. and said, you know, what does what's what's appropriate here? I didn't I, I tried to look at, at people as individuals and not as just I I never was the person who did things, you know, by just by rote. And I think that's one of the right. things that that we tend to get into in corrections or that there's sort of a pressure to do is that you handle every situation that's kind of similar. You say handle everything the same because you're right. going to hear folks say, well, well, if you do this, then such and such will happen. If you don't do, you know, and so I, I, I always tried to resist that 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 pressure to do everything the same i always felt like doing things right. the same for everybody was the least fair thing you could do um yes because you as you know in any situation whether you're dealing with staff or with offenders every situation is different and you know we can say well it's kind of similar to what happened with so and so so i got to do the exact same thing and i always felt like that was a bad approach to take and i think sometimes what happens in corrections is there's a that, that there's that push for consistency where i don't know that consistency is always the thing you know as, as you were taught right. in corrections and so was i you know what you know there's three words that you're told in corrections early on firm fair right. and consistent you know and <laughs> um and I think sometimes a desire to be too consistent is a bit of a cop out, um, and it's not necessarily what's best. I, I think if you have a good reason for what you did and why you did it, I think you can deal with situations differently. Yeah. And um, I also and I, I say that 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 always struck me as a as as something that was a really a, a really important, but I didn't necessarily see that that was uh, applied. I think, I think uh, that way. Yeah. I think consistency, um, I think if you go back and you take a look at the original intent of firm, fair, and consistent, and I agree with you, our policies and laws now almost trap us into having to do that in all of our decisions. But I think if you go back to the original firm, fair, and consistent, that wasn't a way that we dealt with other people. That was how we dealt with ourselves. That was supposed to be internal. Um, yeah. because it is important that as a person, I walk in there and I'm consistent and that I'm the same. Absolutely. And I've said this on the podcast before. Uh, if you're an asshole at home, be an asshole at work. If you're a nice guy at home, be a nice guy at work. Cause you can't change, you know, people are going to see through that. Very difficult. Uh, so that's where mm-hmm. I think the consistency should come is from within, um, but I agree with you totally. Um, the best way to lead people is to do it on an individual basis because everybody has individual needs, individual skills, individual, um, you know, uh, things that they're able to do. And we can't put everybody in the same bucket. We just can't do it. You can't. So I think it's you a great can't. point. You can't. Yeah. And I, yeah, I, that's something I was always, I was always troubled by that. And I think that it, and as you know, you know, being in a bureaucratic environment, that's that's the fallback. The fallback right. is, you know, we oh well, we always do this. Um, well, you know, that's here's the thing that we do, and I think um, I, I think we trap ourselves into making decisions that that aren't in fact fair. You know, if we're looking for firm, fair, and consistent, you know, are we sure. being fair? Is it fair to treat everyone the same? I don't really think yeah. it is fair. You know, my cancel needs and something takes, different than the next person. Yeah, and it takes a, a different kind of leader to step up and and to treat people different. I'm going to give a little shout out here to uh, an interview we're going to have here in a couple of weeks, which is with Anthony Ganji, and uh, he wrote a book about uh, inmate manipulation that's yeah. uh, really good. And uh, he talks in there about uh, internal answers and external answers, and I think a lot of bosses and leaders – they tend to lean on those external answers. So when something comes up, instead of saying, I believe this or I think this, they say, well, I have to do this because I have to do this. 
Right. Yeah. And that takes it off of them in their mind. And uh, that's one of the things he mentions in that book. And I found that very profound. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he was talking about correctional officers. But I, mm-hmm. I thought about that. And I, I saw a lot of leaders over the years who didn't want to step up and make those decisions and take that ownership. So they'd say, well, policy says this, or mm-hmm. this is what we did last time. So this is what I have to do to you. Right. So yeah, it takes a, it takes a strong leader to step up and deal with individuals individually. <laughs> well, I think that's what, that's what, certainly that's what staff want from us. They want to be seen as individuals. They don't want yes. to be just considered, you know, kind of cogs in the, in the machine. And I think that's what happens if you're not careful is when you start saying, well, I'm going to treat everybody the same. Is that really fair? Is that the way that, that we need to treat other people? I don't think it is. And I think right. when, um, you know, I, I, of course I worked at one facility for a long, long time. So I, I probably knew people, um, you know, better than you might, if you were just, you know, if, if, if you were at a place for a fairly short time. So, you know, sure. I knew things about, the you know about our employees that a lot of people didn't know about what you know what's going on in their personal lives i knew about you know where they had come from what they you know you know i i know what that officer was like five years ago and so i know what they're like Mm -hmm. now so you know i i I had some some history there that um i think was beneficial because i think it gave me uh you know some perspectives kind of long view perspective of uh you know, how do, how, do, how do we treat people and, you know, what does this person need as to the next person, what they need, you know, those kind of things. And, mm-hmm. um, again, I, I, I always dealt with that that same way. And, um, <clears throat> you know, when I would deal with making those hard decisions about whether an offender needs to stay in a program or needs to leave, you know, um, right. well, what's the best thing here? That's what I would try to do is try to make decisions and, and not necessarily just do what everybody thought I should do or what, you know, kind of the, 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 the fallback position. Well, if they do this, we always do this. Well, what if we didn't do yeah. that? What if we did this instead? You know, what if doesn't I always do make take you, into consideration? Yeah. Doesn't always make you popular either. No, it doesn't. It really doesn't. <laughs> and, uh, but it's, that's, I mean, I think that's part of, part of it is you have to make those, those hard decisions. You know, I tend to always tended to, give um more grace i think than most and always try to to apply that uh, pretty broadly um right and uh you know um you know as opposed to you know just you know give people necessarily always what they deserve you know i think i think most of us at at many times in our lives are are glad we don't get what we deserve and so <laughs> i always kind of thought that I think that's that's an important thing to to sure. to to do is to give that guy a chance who didn't think you were going to give him a chance. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, I've had a lot of those conversations, and I and uh, you know, I sometimes really really surprised people because of it. You know, well, I didn't expect you to do that. You know, I didn't. I wanted you right. to do it, but I didn't expect you to do it. You know, and so I, I think that's part of it, and trying to apply that. And I think, I think there's a place for, I've always said this, and I remember saying this at a, at a graduation ceremony for correctional officers, officers in, in, in Jefferson city once that, you know, there's a place for compassion and correction. And I think that makes some people yep. really, really nervous. <laughs> um, <laughs> that scares people. That's uh, but I think yep. that, I think that there is a place for that. And you've got to remember that, that, you know, we're not machines. Those offenders aren't machines. Those staff aren't 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 machines. You know, they're yeah. they're they're people. And uh, you know, we do need to think about you know them as individuals and look at the situations and and try to do what's best for sure. them and for everybody. So, you've seen a lot of stuff over the years. Um, if you were talking to, and I know you have, but if you were talking to a new staff member, a new rookie coming into corrections, a uh, piece of advice. I, I remember something I would, I would say to the new staff I actually heard someone say this in an interview. They were at once. And I remember, and this is something I've, I've repeated multiple times is 
I think corrections and I think our business is an honorable business. And I believe that. And I think we provide a very, very important service to the community. I, I think I would encourage um, new staff to see their role that way. Um, mm-hmm. This has to be more than a job to you. I mean, and I don't mean that it, it has to dominate your life in every, every facet, but I think it, it, this is different. We're in the people business, and that's what I've always said about, about corrections is, you know, we're in the people business. I think for new staff, I think it's important to remember that. And obviously, there's all the things that we tell, uh, you know, staff, you know, make sure you don't do this and don't do that and all that kind of stuff. And that, those things are, mm-hmm. are, you know, are, are important. But I think, you know, communication is, is, is critical to being effective in this job. It's, it mm-hmm. has always been critical and always will be. Um, and as you know, um, we've got, you know, roughly the same amount of years of, uh, of service and corrections, and we pretty well you know, kind of overlapped in our, the time that we were doing that. Sure. And so, but, so you've dealt with lots and lots of folks, just like I have, and, um, and dealt with lots of staff. And you, you know, as well as I do, that there are, there are staff that are very effective because they're able to communicate. And mm-hmm. there are staff that barely get by because they are essentially unable to communicate. And Absolutely. Um, you know, the staff that, that, that makes situations better and, you know, the sexual is the staff that makes situations worse. And, you know, because, and that's, and that's, that comes down to communications in the end, you know, what, you know, how does that person see the, in, their, their work? How does that person see that their role? How does that person see their, you know, what, how they should perform their job? And, um, they like say it all come. It comes. It comes down to communication. I mean, you know, you can and should be a, a, a decent person working in corrections. And I think there's. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, you can, you know, have care and concern for other human beings. That's where I come back to. You know, just you know, compassion has a place. And I know, like I say that I know that scares folks, but sometimes, but compassion has a place in in corrections. You know, what Absolutely. is you know what does this situation call for? what is going to be the best approach to make this situation good for you and for the offender. And we've all, mm-hmm. we, you know, we, like I said, we've all been through that. We've had, we've had folks that you knew that if you sent so-and-so into this situation, they would make it better or they would make it worse. And you yep. knew who those people were. You know, I would hope that, that as a new person, they'd want to be that person who makes the situation better. And so I think that's, that's, that, that's one thing I would want, definitely want to impart is, you know, this is, this is good work. It's work that needs to be done. It's work that society needs to be, needs to do. And nope. I, I think we, you know, our, our staff need to be role models and they need to take that seriously for the people mm-hmm. they deal with. Um, set a good example, be there for the, you know, like I say, there's things you don't do obviously, but they're, you know, they're, you can be a decent human being. And I think we want to encourage the new staff to come on and realize, you know, there's room for that there. We, we sure. and not only room for it. It's what we need. We need you to yeah. come in and be, you know, be able to, to, to deal with situations, deal with people and, and remember that they're, they're just people. And your job is not yep. to punish them. Your job is to, uh, a correction officer's role is very, very important. That prison officer that you know is is so critical to what we do, and um, they can have a lot more impact than sometimes they maybe they think they can. I think so. Yeah, you know, you can you can be the person who helps somebody change their their life, and uh, and I I really believe that, and I so I, I I that's what I would encourage you know staff to to do and and be as they as they as they go into the job. Um, and and go forward in their careers and hopefully have long, prosperous careers. Sure, sure. Well, Brian, um, 
I can't thank you enough for coming on here today. It's been great uh, reconnecting with you and uh, hearing your story. I mean, I knew a part of it, but I didn't get to, I had never known all of that. So very interesting the way you grew up around corrections and, and found that path in and then the path that you took to retire as a warden. So I appreciate you coming on here today. Do you have a, do you have an email in case somebody wants to uh, contact you or look you up? Sure, of course. I uh, You can email me at uh, Brian with an I, um, an underscore, O'Connell, um, without an apostrophe, though my name has one, O'Connell, O-C-O-N-N-E-L-L, uh, at att dot net. Um, you can be reached that way. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Okay. As you said, that's kind of how we reconnected and how I've, I've connected it with is. quite a few folks through... Uh, you know, around the country, um, in regards to corrections. And so I'm on LinkedIn, uh, How's... An, age, an organization that I've been involved in, um, since for about the last year or so. Um, and that I'm, I'm a big supporter of is, you know, there's a organization, um, that's headed by an individual, um, by the name of Brian Kane. Brian is part of, he has started a nonprofit corrections company, um, called social profit corrections. And um, it is very interested in being really kind of changing or reimagining corrections and the way the approach we take. And um, uh, I, uh, when I connected with him through LinkedIn, I've uh, really uh, kind of have a, a kindred spirit there as far as somebody who's very in in corrections and and in doing corrections in some ways, you know, quite differently maybe than it's been done in the past or. Just taking mm-hmm. a different approach as far as um, normalization, talking about and ju- and uh, um, you know coaching and such. And so, anyway, it, it's really an interesting. You have a website? Uh, yeah, um, it'll be uh, SPC. Uh, I think it's dot com, but um, it might be dot org. Um, right off the top of my head, but you know, people can learn more about that. And like I say I, I'm kind of in an advisory role with with that organization, and uh, and they're seeking to uh, essentially, you know, kind of be out there in the correction space, uh, trying to, they say, kind of do, maybe do corrections a little differently. He's a retired uh, private corrections uh, prison warden, and so had a vision to to kind of carry out here in regards to corrections and really want to kind of transform it, really. And, uh, and it's, and I, you know, like I say, I've, I've, I, I feel similarly about about his approach and what he wants to do, and so anyway, I, I'm involved with with that as well, um, and so sure. it's something uh, folks should check out. Well, we'll uh, I'll make sure I get the right uh, link, and I'll put it if you'll click information uh, below this podcast. Sure. I'll make sure that link's in there for you, so that people can take a look at that and sure. contact you guys. Yeah. Well, I thank you, Brian. I appreciate thank it. You, Great interview, and uh, I look forward to talking to you some more. Awesome. Have a great day. Thanks, Mike. If you enjoy these podcasts, the best way to support the Prisoner Officer Podcast is to share these episodes with your friends or or family on social media. Let me invite you to visit www.theprisonofficer.com. If you haven't already, check out the Prison Officer Podcast on Facebook and click that little follow button. Or leave us a message, or better yet, leave us a review. And if you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, Google, or Spotify, please click the subscribe button. Until next time, I'm Mike Cantrell. Watch your back, and please take care of each other out there behind those walls.